So we're going to look at if both variables can be determined. Like, so if <coughs> we're using the two letters x and y. So in this first example, uh, y is a function of x, but I can't solve for x explicitly. If I try to solve for x, I can sort of get there, but I get that plus minus. So because I can't write it as x equals one thing, it's x equals multiple things, I cannot uh, write x as a function of y. So in this case, x is not a function of y. Uh, there are plenty of times where you have an equation where not only is x a function of y, but also y is a function of x. So for example, if it was uh, x cubed, I could solve all the way for either of the two variables without the plus minus. So there are plenty of times where you could have x a function of y and y is a function of x. So let's write down what would happen then. So if x is uniquely determined by y, and y is uniquely determined by x, <coughs> so if x uniquely determined by y, that means x equals sum f of y. And if y is uniquely determined by x, that means y is some function of x. So that's what it means to be uniquely determined. You're a function of the other variable. So we have these two functions to relate x and y. And if we would compose them together, so <coughs> x is f of y. If I apply the g function to both sides, like this. Uh, one thing over here, what is g of x? We already wrote it down. g of x is y. What does this relationship tell you about G and F. Kind of tricky to see, but if you have two functions composed and you get back what you put in, how are those two functions related? The little circle is that off. Of, yeah. <coughs> so it's a function composition. So it's F is going first and then G is getting the input from the output of F. So it's the same thing as putting parentheses around there? Yep. So we got g of f of x like that. Ooh, of y, wow. Mean reciprocal? Kind of reciprocals. There's a special word for this. They cancel each other out. So we call those types of functions inverses. Right, if they're gonna cancel each other out, they're inverses. Let's see if they're gonna cancel each other out the other direction. So what I'm gonna start with is the other function relationship, which is y equals g of x. And now I'm going to uh, f both sides. So we'll apply the f function to both sides. <coughs> so we got f of g of x. And then looking up, I see f of y at the very top is also known as x. So what this tells us, if we compose the other order, we also get the identity. So g of f is the identity, and f of g is the identity. So they're inverses of each other. <coughs> so we kind of discovered they were inverses off a of property, not off of computing one from the other. So we saw that if you compose the two, they cancel out. That's another way to detect you have an inverse. So now we're going to look at functions of two independent variables. <coughs> and another thing you're going to discover reading this book is that things are written in a slightly different way than we may talk about them now. Uh, but I think that's probably a good thing to see things from different perspectives because it's how people are thinking about math and talking about math 
40, 50 years ago in the 60s. And they were obviously talking about algebra and functions, so the same stuff we're talking about, but they just talked about it in slightly different ways. So it's good to get different perspectives on things. Uh, especially something uh, very well defined like math and calculus. So if x and y uniquely determine z, then of course that means that z is a function of x and y. What could you say about the domain of f? You can't say very much about it. How many dimensions will this domain have? Something R2. So it'll be inside R2. So about the only thing we can really say it's a subset of R2. Well, that's about the only thing just from what's written on the board that I can say about the domain. And so we'll define a region right now. So a subset S of R2 is a region if, this may be slightly different than how we define region in Calculus 3, so we're going to use the definition that's in the textbook we're working with right now. So it's a region if there's two properties it needs to have. Any element or any point in S is an interior point. If you remember, interior point means there's a small neighborhood inside the set S that contains this point. So it means there exists, I think we use, uh, use epsilon or delta. In my notes, I have it written as D with an epsilon of X. And this is the disk centered at X with the radius epsilon. So if I write it in set notation, this is all y in R2 such that x minus y is less than epsilon. Now, <coughs> when I write this, remember x is in S and S is a subset of R2. So what that means is just written, writing that, that means x is a two-dimensional point because x comes from a set and that set lives inside two-dimensional space. So when I write this, <coughs> x in this case is a two-dimensional, is a point in two dimensions, or a vector if you want to think of it as a vector. Uh, y is also a two-dimensional point, so what we're looking at right here is the difference between x and y taking the magnitude. So that's the distance between the point x and the point y. So you have a distance, and then we're basically looking at the, pretend that's a circle. Uh, so it's every point that's within epsilon of the center, which is x. When you take the magnitude, kind of draws a circle around it? Yeah, it's, well, it's everything with magnitude less than epsilon. So I probably should draw the boundary as a dotted line, but that would take too long. So, so it's not including the boundary right here. And then this is supposed to live inside of some big blobby s right there. So every point's interior. We can write this way, way, way faster if we use some calculus three language. This is why a lot of the uh, math notation is so powerful. We have the boundary operator of S is the empty set. So that's the fast way to write this. There are no boundary points. Everything is an interior point. Another way to write it, S interior, is the same as S. So there are two ways to write it. So the interior is the entire set, meaning there's nothing that's not an interior. And the other way to say it is the boundary has nothing inside of it. All right, so it's a region if it's open. That's what this first one says. Every point's an interior point. That's what the definition of open was. And the second one, S is connected. <coughs> 
and what connected means, any two points in S can be uh, connected by a curve inside of S. So any x1, x2 inside S, there exists a path. And we used alpha for paths last quarter. So there's a path alpha. Uh, such that alpha 0 equals x1. Alpha of 1 equals x2 and alpha lives inside of S. So if we think about some blobby set, we have two points inside of it, and there needs to exist some curve, alpha, that goes from one to the other that lives inside of the set. Uh, you can have weird shapes, like a horseshoe shape set, like this, even though the straight line curve between these two points is not in the set, I can still very easily get from one to the other like that. So that would still be a region as long as uh, the battery is empty. So what's not a region? It's pretty easy to draw not regions. Two separate non-connected sets uh, would not be considered a region. All right, so that's all it takes to be a region. Uh, it's about a region if it can be enclosed in a finite circle. So it could be a large circle, but it does need to be finite. It may have a radius of 10 million or 10 trillion, but it can't have a radius of infinity. So I find if it can be closed by a finite circle. So that's bounded. And now we have our next definition is an implicit function. Good to, I think it's better to just show an example here. <coughs> so we'll do this with just an example. All right, solve for y. We have y is plus or minus, uh, so we can't solve for y. You have the exact same problem if you try to solve for x. So solving for x, you get the exact same thing with a 25 minus the y squared. So x is not uniquely determined by y, y is not <coughs> uniquely determined by x. And that's what it takes to be a implicit function. <coughs> so if x is not determined by y and y is not determined by x, then we have an implicit function. I'll write the uh, precise definition right now. So 
So we'll <clears throat> start out with just having the function equal the constant zero. If you need it to equal not zero, like for example 10, all you'd have to do is subtract 10 on both sides and that your, your new function would be equal to zero. So uh, we just put zero on the right side just to make it a little more standard. So if you have this uh, f of x, y equals zero, for example, that was, where was it, right here, you could think of this as f of x, y equals zero. So that's an example right there. So if you start out with that uh, equation, uh, but So this uh, function defines y as an implicit function of x. on some interval a, b if there exists a g of x that goes from this, I think this a, b is supposed to be i. So the interval a, b we're going to call capital I. If there exists a g of x function that goes from i into r, such that such that f of x comma g of x equals zero for all x in that interval i. So this is a pretty serious definition, or at least it looks tricky. What we're going to do is prove that that last example actually defines a implicit function. And I'm going to give you the interval that we're going to work with. <coughs> so we're going to show this f of x, y equals x squared plus y squared minus 25 equals 0 defines y as an implicit function of x. Uh, for, I have to state the interval, x in the interval negative 5 to 5. Alright, so just looking at the definition, what do you have to create? <coughs> What is supposed to exist? Have I talked about that letter? There exists. So we have to create a function to show that one exists. We have to create a function, we'll call it g of x, going from the interval negative 5 to 5 with this property right here, that f of x comma the function we're going to create is always 0. So it's our goal to create Yep, create g of x, and it's supposed to go from our interval right here, negative 5 to positive 5 into r. So the best way to think about doing this, you're basically trying to write y as a function of x. So do your best to write y as a function of x. It's not going to work, but do your best, and then that will give you some clues as to what g should be. <coughs> So do your best to solve for y. We basically did that before. So chances are g of x is either the positive or negative square root of x squared minus 25. It's 
Probably one of those two. So now we're going to do try them out. So let's just try the positive one first. Does it make a difference if it's the square root of x squared minus 25 or the square root of 25 minus x squared? Uh, it may or may not depend. Um, Wouldn't it be 25 minus x squared in this case? Probably. I probably just did really bad algebra. Did I do that? You moved 25. <coughs> yep. Yeah, it should be 25 minus x squared. I think it will make a difference in this problem. Some problems it may not. It kind of depends on like how the symmetry is going, things like that. Uh, we are, I mean, we're obviously working on a circle of radius 5, so it's pretty symmetric. All right, so we're going to try 25 minus x squared. Now what we're going to do is function composition. We're going to do it carefully. <coughs> So I'm going to write the original uh, function, which is f of xy. That's x squared plus y squared minus 25. Now, the coordinate I'm going to change is the y coordinate. So I'm going to do the silly thing where I write a box for the variable I'm about to modify. So I'm using box notation, but I only am going to replace the second variable. I'm not going to mess around with the x, just the y. So this is f of x comma a box. Now all I'm going to do is figure out what is f of x comma g of x, which of course is x comma square root 25 <coughs> minus x squared. So all you have to do is put 25 minus x squared into the box and see what you get. So go ahead and do that right now. Should be pretty straightforward. Mission accomplished. So you don't necessarily have to intuitively understand every de definition in order to actually show that it satisfies the definition. As long as you can read it and try to kind of guess, oh, well, I knew I needed a function. I wasn't really sure what function I needed other than <coughs> it needs to input x on some small interval and have this property right there. So in my notes, I do have uh, what section. So so at some point, we started section two, or chapter two, I should say. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh. So this is one and two together. So now I'll make sure that we go to three properly. So that was a bunch of definitions got into that section. <coughs> So I'll just write C section one. So unfortunately, all my section two stuff jumped up in the section one notes. So we're about to hit section three. So this is the differential equation. So we're going to look at ordinary differential equations. I think that's the name of your book. Yeah, ordinary differential equations. I think so, yeah. There are, I think there's a couple definitions in one. If you, it doesn't really matter like what goes in one and two, but I think I did it ordered with the book so you can figure out where it cuts off. But your homeworks are grouped up in chunks of five anyways. Uh, so ordinary differential equation. <coughs> so I think I talked about differential equation already. So now all we had to do is talk about what does ordinary mean. So ordinary means not partial derivatives. That's all ordinary means. 
So I'm just going to underline the word ordinary differential equation is a differential equation. So we're going to abbreviate differential equation by diff EQ. So it's a differential equation without <coughs> partial derivatives. So you would think that a differential equation with partial derivatives would be called a partial differential equation, and it is. So we're not going to look at partial differential equations. So we're just going to use the word differential equation when we're going to talk about partial different of uh, ordinary differential equations. So whenever we say differential equation, there's going to be no partials. So let's write down some notation. A lot of this is going to be familiar. There may be a few new ways to write some derivatives here. We'll have y as a function of x. So how many ways can we write y prime? So we can write y prime equals f prime equals d dx of f of x. Uh, how else can we write it? Dy dx. <laughs> dy dx. You can write it as d dx with a y next to it. You can write it as df dx of x like this. <coughs> you can use a dot notation too. I think this textbook doesn't. Isn't that when it's with respect to t, with respect to time? So depends. Well, so that all depends. There is no like official standard any notation, so it kind of depends on what book you're reading as to. <laughs> so yeah, in a physics book, I have a feeling all the dots are probably time derivatives. Yeah. Um, that may not always be true though. So it kind of just depends. Like you, you have to just read the book, like the introduction. It just has to be context. Yeah, you just have to know. I mean, probably if there's dots above it, it's probably a derivative, and probably a t derivative, but not necessarily all the time. All right, so that's why we're going over notation. That's why we do notation pretty much every quarter, especially when we change from your calculus book to your differential equations book. All right, so we got this. There is a new letter, capital D, stands for derivative. Classic. And let's see, it won't really matter to us because we're going to generally be only taking a derivative with respect to one variable, but if you needed to, you can signify what variable you are taking a derivative of with a little <coughs> d sub x. So we're pretty much going to only be taking uh, x derivatives or whatever our independent variable is. And if we do y double prime, we can pretty much repeat all these ones above, just writing them as derivative derivative. So we could write d dx d dx f of x, which of course could be written as d dx squared f of x. I don't really like to write squared derivatives like this, but you don't need parentheses in the denominator because dx is one uh, a term you can't separate apart. So it's usually just written like that. And of course you can always Whenever you've written y as f of x, wherever you see f of x, you can substitute y in there. So I'm not going to rewrite the exact same ones with y's. Uh, let's see. And we'll go, I think the df dx, I, I think would be df squared over dx squared. I'm pretty sure. No, it would not be. It would be d squared f. Pretty sure it would be written like that. 
and the last two are very easy. You just go d squared fx <coughs> or d dx squared f of x. Is that big g just in this book? Or? I'm not expert on differential equations, so I don't. I haven't read many other books. I read the one that I used in undergrad and this one. Um, and I'm not sure what they used in the undergrad book. I knew that like 10 years ago, but not now. Is that what we're going to be using in this class mostly? Is it uh, when we treat <coughs> differential operators as polynomials, yes. So at some <laughs> point, things will get really kind of crazy, and we will treat differential operators as polynomials. And we'll do crazy stuff like factoring them and partial fractions and all the cool stuff we did with polynomials <coughs> and rational functions. But we're going to treat them like they're derivatives. So I'll just give you a fast preview. d squared plus d of maybe sine, for example. You would distribute right here. And so the second derivative of sine, I think, is negative sine. And derivative of sine is cosine, right there. So we apply the d squared operator plus d. You're basically doing it with multiplication, like that. So we will be doing things like that. Um, and then the other cool thing is you can factor this. And you can apply this first, and then apply the derivative of that at the end. And you'll get the exact same result. So pretty much going to be almost treating the derivative as a polynomial. It's a polynomial operator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So my basic uh, goal of teaching, to the way I teach differential equations is I, well, I'm not sure you could actually cover this. Is there 700 pages in the book, something like that? I think it would be a challenge to try to get through that many pages. Almost 800. 800. It's a good guess. Um, I don't think you can get through 800 pages in a quarter. So my goal is to spend a lot of time getting into the introduction, notation, how basically how to compute all these things so that if you need to go to one of the more obscure sections later on, that you'll be able to understand what they're saying and be able to read the, the book in that section, as opposed to spending a small amount of time just kind of hitting, trying to hit each section. So I'll spend a lot more time in the intro and basically we will derive almost everything in the first third of the book. And that should, and then we'll, we'll hit different topics after that, but that should give you the baseline understanding so that you could go and read the other sections that we don't cover. Give us the foundation. Giving you the foundation, yeah. And, I'll, and I cover the stuff that I think is more interesting and more useful. So polynomial operators are super cool, so we'll definitely be doing those. All right, I think that's good enough for derivative notation. So did you say that um, the homeworks, each homework is like five sections in for like? You have to look at the table of contents in the book, but I'm, I just have it grouped the way your book's grouped up. Okay. So it does a bunch of like introduction stuff first, and I think it does, I don't know, you can look in the book if you want to see how it's grouped. You can answer that question. I just used whatever the author decided was a good way to group the topics. I think it's a pretty reasonable way to do it, I think. So we'll just do an uh, example to start out with. <coughs> so we'll pick an easy differential equation. So first of all, why is this an equation? Uh, it's got an equal sign, all right. <laughs> so we got that out of the way. Why is this a differential equation? Because <laughs> God derivative. All right, so that's why it's a differential equation. Why, why is it ordinary and not partial? Because we're only doing ordinary. There's only one variable. There's only one. So there's kind of technically two. So there's another variable that's not really written out here. You can pick whatever letter you want to use. I'm going to go with Zero. X. Letter. Uh, variable. You can put a <laughs> letter in front of it. Zero. Zero is a constant. It needs to be a variable. Oh. And you can't reuse y. Just because the derivative of y is with respect to something? Yeah, it's with respect to something. So it's not really written that it's with respect to x, but it could be with respect to time. That's t is another great variable to use. So I'm just going to go with x right here. 
so I could rewrite it as uh, dy dx plus regular y equals zero. So this is our solution is going to have an x and a y in it. So our solution will be uh, a function uh, of x. I could rewrite this differential equation y prime equals negative y, just subtract that y to the other side. What type of function has a derivative that's negative what you started with? So, so I think sine would work if it was a double, like a double sine. derivative would have been, uh, sine would be a solution to this one. So, double sine. Cosine? so derivative of cosine is negative sine, not negative cosine. So again, if it was a double prime, then I think sine and cosine would both be solutions. But unfortunately, it's a single prime. Uh, e to the negative y. Oh, there we go. E, so in this case, <coughs> our solution is going to look like y equals, let's try e to the negative x. So what we're going to do is test this out. So I'm taking a guess right here. <coughs> now what we're going to do is check. That's the important part. You don't just guess, you guess and then check unless you've been doing this forever, but you still should check. All right, how in the world do I check? So take a derivative. So y prime is e to the negative x times negative one or negative e to the negative x. Your intuition should tell you it's gonna work right now. And it's all I'm gonna do. I recommend you check in the original. You may have done some algebra incorrectly, so I strongly recommend checking the original one that was written down. So we got y prime plus y equals zero. So y prime negative e to the negative x plus regular y is e to the negative x. And those are exactly the same but opposite signs. So there we go. So we got a solution. So I put a box around that this is a solution. All right, solve your first differential equation. Good job. <laughs> All right. How about this right here? Y equals zero. What's the derivative of y of this y? Zero. Is this a solution? Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty lame solution, <laughs> but it's a solution, so it's another solution. There should be a couple other solutions, uh, but we'll look at. <coughs> we're not going to try to exhaust every single possibility, so we'll look at another easy example and see how in the world we would solve that one. So we're basically going to be guessing and checking for a little while, and then we'll develop some methods that work in general on certain forms of differential equations. So that's how the first about third of the class is going to go.